Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, July 23rd, 2022. It was another great week of shows with great guests and great topics. We kicked off the week with a look at how state and local governments are working to retain and attract new employees. Let's take a look. When we were talking earlier about the hard to fill positions, um, you know, I think it's important for um, <clears throat> your viewers to really understand that, you know, governments for the most part are well positioned right now to, to hire folks, you know, when relatively overall, relatively healthy tax and fee revenues, a couple tranches of federal federal funds, put them in a position where they're able to hire and they need to hire. But what we've seen is just because they have the ability to hire and they need to hire, the local labor force doesn't always provide the, the level of skill talent they need to fill those positions. So, for example, on our workforce survey that we uh, that we just released, um, 94% of HR directors, 94% said they're not getting the number of applications to fill the positions that they have open for registered nurses, for example. Uh, 94% also said the number of applications they're receiving from from uh, from um, interested applicants um, do not fill the number of positions open for engineers. The si similar trends for police, IT employees, maintenance workers. Th there is right now uh, a mismatch for some of the key positions in terms of availability of labor with the, the need to hire labor. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind going forward, um, especially as governments, again, are in a position to hire and they need to hire. And rightfully so, getting more um, uh, <clears throat> attention by elected and appointed officials throughout the state and local community. Um, uh, what we're seeing not only is um, efforts are being placed through a DEI lens, not only on the, rec the recruitment side to make sure that you're casting a wider net for available uh, when you're advertising your positions and you're reaching out to the individuals in the community regarding available positions in the governments, but also on the retention side, uh, ensuring that that Benefits, um, uh, employee programs are all geared to ensuring that everyone feels um, um, included and um, part of the organization and positions themselves so that they're willing to stay with the, the government uh, entity for as long as, as long as they want and don't feel the need that they have to change positions. And so DEI from a city manager's perspective or HR director's perspective is really being applied not only on sort of the uh, recruitment side, but also the retention side as well. And um, it, it, for those, uh, we'll put up our our, um, our website um, perhaps later in, in this in this um, uh, interview. But we just released a new DEI survey report um, that sort of provides a lot of the context around sort of what the DEI programs in the local government sector are looking like in 2022. Um, different approaches, certain barriers that might be in place, and so I'd encourage your your uh, your viewers to take a look at that as well. On the retirement preparedness side, uh, you know, one of the, one of the um, findings from our workforce survey would found that only about 41% of all uh, HR directors we we surveyed felt their employees were were financially ready for retirement. That said, um, on when we focus on both the compensation and benefit side of it, um, HR directors really see benefits as being a strategic advantage for for the sector. So, for example, 44. Uh, percent of HR directors thought salary was the salaries they were offering overall were competitive with the, the private sector. Um, it was 85 percent for for benefits, and so I, I think it's it's a sort of a multi-layered conversation when it comes to preparedness versus sort of the strategic advantage that that these benefits provide the sector. I, I also say more generally on the retirement side, um, when we asked. Um, what HR directors know about their, and, and generally about their retirement eligible employees. Um, and what has been surprising is 53% of, of HR directors reported that their retirement eligibles are actually accelerating the retirement. Um, this is almost a, a complete flip from what we saw following the Great Recession when a lot of retirement eligibles were delaying their retirement. So it's, it's sort of a mixed bag. Like, Governments are in a good position in terms of providing high quality retirement and health benefits. That's great. Uh, there are some concerns about sort of retirement readiness, but at the same time, the pandemic, the, the, the natural uh, flow of sort of the underlying age demographics of the sector, 
is leading to uh, an increase in retirements um, that have been planned for a while, but perhaps have been accelerated by, by the pandemic. And that's something that our institute's certainly going to be keeping an eye on. And, and I think it's important for um, elected and appointed officials to, to keep an eye on as well. Well, and I think that that sort of some of the impacts of inflation and uncertainty is already uh, impacting the conversations going on, both at the state and local levels in terms of um, cost of living adjustments and and um, adjustments to pay schedules. For example, so several states around the country and many local governments around the country are reevaluating uh, the pay schedules that they've been offering um, that often have been very um, um, stagnant in terms of adjustments being made, of, especially over the past decade. And so there's a, they're taking a fresh look at, at whether or not their pay schedules are competitive and whether or not the annual changes reflect in, in the realities of, of in a higher inflationary environment. On the retirement side, you're also seeing um, uh, either automatic or um, ad hoc reevaluation of cost of living adjustments in many uh, for many uh, retirement systems about whether en enabling the retirement benefits to keep up with the impacts of inflation. So I think it's on both sides of the retirement uh, line in terms of uh, inflation being accounted for. Or, um, and I, I would only expect that to continue going forward. Next up, we discussed how children's vision problems go undiagnosed. Let's take a look. Visual impairment is actually the number one cause of disability in kids. And it's estimated that one out of four kids has a vision problem that either hasn't been diagnosed yet or hasn't been treated. So we have this huge amount of kids with vision problems, but unfortunately, only one out of five U.S. kids is getting their vision tested during the preschool years. So we're missing out on a really important opportunity to diagnose these problems early when we can still treat them. And you're actually a really lucky kid because most kids aren't even aware that they have vision problems. They're born with the eyes that they have, and so to them, their vision seems normal. And that's why screening kids for vision problem, meaning testing them either in school or at the primary care doctor's office, it's so important because most kids aren't going to be able to tell us on their own that they can't see well. The number one cause of vision impairment in kids is simply needing glasses. And that seems like such a simple problem, just give them glasses. But there's a whole kind of host of issues that are interfering. One is early detection. If kids aren't detected early for vision problems, they can actually develop permanent vision loss called amblyopia. So basically, if you're not seeing sharp images during childhood, the connections between your eye and your brain don't form properly, and it leads to permanent vision loss. So after the age of 10 or 12, kids who have amblyopia are no longer able to have any improvement in their vision. And so if we don't diagnose these problems on time, kids go on to a life of visual impairment. And that means not doing as well in school. As they grow up, they're less productive in the worst place, work, workplace, excuse me. They have more car accidents um, and even things like increased rates of depression and dementia. So for a child's whole life, if we don't catch them early, they can have a tremendous amount of problems from visual impairment. The two places that US kids get tested for vision most commonly is in school, at school screenings or at the primary care doctor getting screened by their pediatrician or their family doctor. And so during the COVID pandemic, when schools were closed and people were avoiding the doctor, that meant that a lot of kids weren't getting their vision tested. Well, we're halfway through. When we come back, we'll take a look at the other half of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, 
current affairs and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repaired for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. This week, we also discussed tips for boater safety. Let's take a look. That information is available in so many places. So, you know, a simple uh, search engine with your favorite browser, favorite search engine uh, will come up with all sorts of opportunities within your state, things that are um, approved by your state. Uh, we have taken the, the, the time to go through and pull together uh, a, a whole list of boating safety uh, education providers and put them on our site, like you mentioned, the watersportsfoundation.com. Um, those, those links will take you back to the, to the information that you need for your state. But I got to tell you, um, your boating safety courses are, in general, are a great idea, even for veteran boaters. Um, every time I take a boating safety course, I can't tell you how many things I learned, things that I've forgotten. But uh, you, you come back and you pick up and you go, you know, this is something I should have known, but obviously I just let it slip. So it's a good idea, even for veteran boaters, to to spend some time. I, I just took one not too long ago. In fact, I used the uh, the Boat US uh, Foundation, which is uh, kind of like the AAA, if you will, for boating. Um, they offer a free boating course that's respective to your state. So if you click in from Alabama or from Florida and you take their course, that course has been uh, customized to meet the laws and requirements for the, for your home state. And it took me uh, over the course of the weekend, a few hours on Saturday and a few hours on Sunday, and I completed the, uh, the safety course. And then the, the nice thing about the Boat US course is it's free. They don't charge for it. Uh, they do ask if you thought it was a good enough course that you make a donation at the end. And I certainly did because I thought it was. And then a few days later in the mail, you get, you get your state voter ID card, which is, you know, something like this that just you know, is, is a car, a pocket card you can share with an officer should you be stopped somewhere. Or if you're going to rent a boat in another state, some states might require that you have had a boater safety course and just pop this card out, show them to the rental operator, and then you're ready to go. So we, we definitely uh, condone boater safety courses. In fact, it's the theme of our whole campaign this year is if people will just take a boater safety course or a paddler safety course on the paddling side, they'll learn everything they need to know about being a safe, safe boater on the water. That's, that's right. Uh, irrespective of what kind of vessel you're on, you'll be required to have a, a properly sized life jacket for each person on board. And, um, and what we're finding is uh, through the course of our law enforcement interaction with the public is the compliance rate is very high. So simply having that gear on board it, it, it is not what we wanna see. It's the use of that gear. Uh, you mentioned, you know, a life jacket is pretty easy to put on. It's pretty easy to put on when things are going well, like right when you step on that boat. But if you're in the water, uh, if you're in the stress of the moment, your boat's taking on water, maybe some of that bad weather we talked about earlier catches up with you. Um, people have a difficult time putting on their life jackets under that kind of stress. Or what we're seeing is often they that just does not register with them 
until it's too late to put that life jacket on. So uh, life jackets come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, the inflatable life jackets are where so many people are turning for life jackets that are cool and comfortable and non-confining. Something we've seen lately, though, is, uh, is those inflatable life jackets. Uh, they, they take maintenance and inspection. Each inflatable life jacket has an inflation mechanism in it. And there's things in, in this inflation mechanism that need uh, replacement or service. They have expiration dates on them. So I would tell people, if you're turning to that inflatable life jacket as, as a way to wear a life jacket on the water, one that's cool, comfortable, and non-confining, to make sure you follow your uh, manufacturer's recommendations for the maintenance and service and replacements of the uh, consumable items in, in that. Um, and, and I was going to say, and, go ahead, Paul. Uh, and, and that's what we're seeing with, with almost all these boating accidents. It's, you know, they've got everything they need on board. It's that they're not using that, uh, that gear that they have on board, or it's kind of an operational thing. You know, you think about a boat uh, taking on water. That's a very common cause of a boat uh, sinking and, and, and subsequent drowning. So think beyond the required equipment. There's, there's nothing in the regulations that requires you to have a simple damage control kit but it's a great idea to have that damage control kit on board. Simple things like uh, foam balls, Nerf balls, things like that. You, you can pack those things into the, the below the waterline fittings on that boat and, and, uh, and, you know, basically save it from sinking with something as simple as a foam ball. So, um, you know, that, that boating uh, 101 course that Jim took, and interestingly enough, I, I have my certificate right, <laughs> right here. I, I was, I was trained pretty well by the Coast Guard. I ran the rescue boats, but had never taken, that state kind of course. So I obviously wanted to see what my recreational uh, boaters are taking. So I took that as well. And they're great courses, uh, very good courses. But uh, it's like when you get that, that driver's license, the real learning takes place after you get that license and you get out, out there and start and get involved in, in, in participating in that activity. So um, once you, once you do that, there's, there's a good bit more to learn. Uh, don't, don't let, don't let your learning stop with that course. That's a, uh, that's a good starting point for additional learning. And, and Jim and I spend a lot of our time trying to find uh, quality information for those boaters to access. And, and Jim's website uh, obviously has a lot of that information on it. Very good videos and, and, and images on it. Our own website, uscgboating.org, has much of that, that, that same similar kind of content. So let's get those boaters beyond that boater education 101 and get them up into the 102 kind of territory that, that Jim and I spent a lot of our time uh, trying to promote. And it depends on where the body of water is. You know, you'll have a state agency in every state that uh, patrols the waters on a state level, but um, the Coast Guard patrols on a, on a federal level. But what you'll find is on, on local levels, you know, like your local county sheriff may have boats on the water or even municipalities. You know, if you get down to the municipality level, uh, you may find that cities have have um, police officers on the water. So, you know, that's that's the um, the enforcement side of of recreational boating safety. Paul and I like to think we can try to avoid that if we can just pe teach people, you know, to be safe and courteous boaters um, and to avoid the things that will bring them into a situation where they're engaging an officer in the first place. So that's that's mainly where our focus is. You know, a minute ago, we were talking about life jackets and Paul mentioned um, that, you know, putting a life jacket on in the water once you've had an incident uh, is incredibly difficult. Well, we decided to take take a look at that and uh, we just produced a video. It's the last one in our series for this year. I, I'm happy to say that yesterday I got to review it for the first time. It um, put four people in the water of different ages and sizes. Uh, and then threw life jackets at them in the water and said, put them on and put a timer on to see how long it took them to get to actually get them on. It's not as easy as it looks. And especially if you're in bad weather conditions where there's waves and wind blowing at you. And like Paul said, you're panicked. Um, trying to get a life jacket on in those conditions would be even worse. So uh, we're going to be releasing that video pretty soon on our website and through all of our media channels. And, um, you know, the idea is just to try to get people to realize that wearing a life jacket is, is is where it's at having them on board is required by law but if you're wearing the life jacket that's when you're going to actually save yourself in the, in the event that something does go wrong and finally we discussed medicare part d prescription drug prices 
and how to manage them effectively. Let's take a look. Brand name medicines are medicines that are patent protected, that are relatively newer, and based on the current system, they are uh, the drugs that are marketed by a, a specific company. Um, and, and for example, you could, talk, you could think about Lipitor, which is a really common cholesterol medicine uh, that came out uh, decades ago. And for a while, it was a blockbuster drug that helped reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes. And it was expensive when it was on patent um, by the company, uh, Pfizer. And so it, you know, over time though, based on our current drug pricing system, we then have generic medicines uh, that enter the market to lower prices uh, over, and make it easier for people to get access to those medicines. And so now there are many different generic atorvastatins, uh, which is the same medicine that is shown to be chemically equivalent to the Lipitor and uh, it, the same sort of level in your body. And those medicines are nearly identical. They should be, there should be no difference in the way that your body processes the medicine, in the way that it works in your body to lower your cholesterol. And the generic medicine, it's much cheaper. We know that since it became cheaper, more people are able to access it. And that's what I recommend to my patients. Um, now, there are certain medicines where patients report difference in the way that they believe their body processes the medicine. And those are some select drugs that that is more common to happen. One of the common ones that you may hear that with is a thyroid medicine called levothyroxine. Um, and and the, the brand name version is called Synthroid. But chemically they're equivalent and it's actually required by the Food and Drug Administration for any company that brings a generic drug to market to prove that its, met, its new generic medicine is equivalent to the brand name medicine. And that that is the same effect in the body. And that's what we call bio. Not be worried about a generic medicine uh, that you're getting, as long as you're getting it from a reputable pharmacy. Um, there are very, very rare cases of there being low quality generic medicines. Uh, but just keep in mind that the vast majority of generic medicines are very safe, they're effective, and they work really well. As a primary care doctor, when I'm thinking about prescribing a medicine for a patient in my clinic, you know, I look at the, the risks of every of the medicine and the benefits, and then I look at the patient um, is going to benefit from that. And assuming that the, the benefits are much greater than the risks, I'll, give, I'll provide some counseling to the patient about the medicine and what to expect, just in case, because everyone's body is a little different when it comes to reactions. Um, and then I'll prescribe the medicine. And typically, if it's a generic medicine, if it's a medicine that's already generic, I'll prescribe it as, to go back to our old example, a torvastatin. And there are, based on the state that you live in, laws that allow pharmacists to substitute uh, a generic medicine for a brand name medicine when it exists. Different for other drugs uh, that are what we call biologic drugs, drugs that are injectable drugs like insulin um, or drugs like Humira, um, and, that are injectable medicines. And the substitution there is a little bit different, but each state um, allow, has different laws around whether the pharmacist can automatically substitute for a generic medicine. Most doctors will write uh, for the option to substitute freely. And unless there's a specific reason why you do not want uh, the drug to be substituted for a generic drug, then you can, note, you can make, uh, denote that on the prescription itself. And it'll say, uh, dispense as written, do not substitute. Uh, but generally speaking, like I said, very safe to take a generic medicine, um, especially if your doctor prescribes it to a local pharmacy. I do think that education for your health broadly, and that includes, you know, learning about healthy diets, exercise, and it also includes about learning about your prescription drug plans, your health insurance, you know, Jeff, it's so complicated to understand the nuances of health insurance and prescription drugs, but your life depends on it. Yeah. And so really understanding those differences makes a big deal, especially if you think about every year we have the opportunity to pick a new insurance plan. And that can make a huge difference. The, the type of plan that you pick, sometimes it may be a quick decision. You don't very thoroughly. It can make a huge difference on how much you are asked to pay if you were to have an emergency or an unforeseen accident, um, or even if you just have a lot of chronic medical problems like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, 
And so I do think it's important to ask questions, both as patients and as family members of patients who are in loved ones about, you know, what are my options? This, you know, and, and be very open with your clinicians, your medical providers about how cost affects your ability to get a medicine. You know, as doctors, um, as nurses and, you know, and nurse practitioners, we all want to provide the best possible care we can for our patients. And when we know that cost is what is uh, making it difficult for them to pick up their medicines, we can help provide resources and education and have members on our team, our pharmacists, our pharmacy technicians and others help you to access your medicines uh, at a lower cost when possible. And, but I do recommend you to, you know, do your own sort of uh, in learning um, about this by visiting websites like GoodRx and just seeing like, is, is the medicines I get every month, are they cheaper if I was to get a coupon uh, from GoodRx or are they cheaper on the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs Company website? But just keep in mind one thing, when you buy something that's direct to consumer, meaning you buy something directly from the pharmacy, um, whether it's online or in person, you pay for that out of pocket. And if you're paying for that out of pocket, that means that and you're, not, and you're not using your insurance, which is what happens when you purchase something from GoodRx, a pharmacy via GoodRx or through the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs Company, those costs that you pay do not count towards your out-of-pocket deductible or your annual maximum, which are two parts of your health insurance plan. And that's important because even if it's cheaper a little bit to pay out-of-pocket, um, you sometimes you want that to count towards your, your annual total so that after a while, you can get your medicines at a much, much lower cost. So yeah. I'll just say briefly, you know, we did find in our analysis that Medicare Part D plans could have over $3 billion in 2020 if they had bought drugs, uh, a, a small set of 77 generic drugs at the prices sold by the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs Company. But in our analysis, we did not have the ability to look at how does that affect what patients pay at the pharmacy themselves. It was more about how much, what do taxpayers and what does the insurance of Medicare, the Medicare insurance plan pay uh, to, um, you know, the pharmacies and the drug companies. So, um, just, just something to keep in mind, but definitely educate and you should ask questions about that. And that wraps up this episode of BRN weekly, have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to drop us a line. And don't forget for all the latest charity news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more all in one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, the morning pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content. We'll visit our website and, of course, our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media, academia, and financial services as we analyze all the news and events for the week. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited and do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. 
Call a tax doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.